Let's move to international news now. And a strike on the Al Akhli Baptist Hospital in Gaza last night has left an estimated 500 Palestinians dead. Now, Israel has emphatically denied involvement, saying they have proof it was a misfired rocket from Islamic Jihad. However, Israel has been bombarding Gaza for days in retaliation for the murder of over 1,000 Israeli civilians by Hamas. And many countries in the region do not accept Israel's claim. We've seen street protests across a number of cities in the past 24 hours. In the midst of this, there's still a blockade in place with humanitarian aid stuck at the border until some sort of ceasefire or safe passage in Gaza can be guaranteed. Local humanitarian organization Gift of the Givers has people in Gaza trying to help those in desperate need. Founder Dr. Imtia Suleiman joins me in studio now. Doc, thanks so much for joining us. It is such a terrible time. We have seen horror and bloodshed all round um, in recent days. This hospital attack, um, I know that you have contact with people on the ground in Gaza. I understand it is difficult though to stay in, in contact. Do your people on the ground believe Israel was responsible for this attack? Without a doubt. It's a standard pattern. We've seen it in 2009. We've seen it in 2014. We've seen hospitals damaged while we were there. You know, when we, the tops we did in 2009 and 2014. And now you've, you've struck 15 hospitals already. The, the dean of the medical school that, that I met a few years ago, his house was deliberately struck. He and his entire family has been wiped out. 30 doctors have deliberately been targeted. So now they don't have enough medical personnel there. And now when you knock medical personnel and you increase the number of patients, how do you cope with that kind of situation? Fifteen hospitals have been struck, of which four are totally non-functional. This was the fifth one that was hit. The, the, the groups in, in, in Palestine don't have that kind of weaponry that can be so destructive and wipe out an entire building with one hit. They don't have that kind of weapons. It's obvious. If Israel would have been severely damaged if they, they had those kind of weapons. So it's quite illogical to say they did it themselves. And, and also the, the hospitals itself, the people that were there, you know, there is, it's more than 500. It's close to 800 or 1,000 to what they're telling us. What was said is when we were speaking to the people, well, not me directly, but my team speaking to the other doctors, saying that when the bodies came, most of them were dismembered. The heads were separate from the body. The legs were separated and they were disemboweled. The type of weapon that was used caused serious destruction and damage. And, and the other sad thing was that many people were living there, not as, doc as patients, but as people taking refuge. And the, the, it was just horrendous what happened yesterday. Mm, I mean, it's absolutely horrific. We do know that, that Israel has an Iron Dome, this security protection device, because uh, missiles, rockets do get fired over from Hamas into Israel. So surely there is the possibility that, that some sort of weaponry misfired? I mean, I, I suppose I don't want to believe that someone would deliberately do this. Well, I, won't, I, I disagree with you, Sally. Okay. Uh, yeah. I've seen the pattern, it's too often, too common, and this information is a weapon used in war very often. It's, they don't have that kind of weapon. You, know? I wanna, you mentioned it, um, and I, and I want to pick up on the doctor you mentioned, Dr. Farwana. Uh, I believe he was the dean of the medical school yes. in Gaza. I believe he was a friend of yours. In fact, we're going to put up a picture of him. There he is in the blue shirt, is that right? Well, he's not actually a friend. I met him when I went there. He's I don't know the people. So okay. when you go there, you just meet people for the first time. Okay. Because we support the medical school with bursaries. So, so to talk to me about what you know about what happened to him and his family. From, from, I haven't spoken to him in years. Yeah. But from what my team members told me today, that his family, he was, his house was directly targeted, and he and his family was wiped out. And the thing is, it's a consistent pattern. You've got to follow the pattern. 400 families have been completely wiped out. Civilian districts have completely been flattened. I mean, how would they miss, if they've got misfire rockets, why did only one misfire in 10 days and hit a hospital where there's so many refugees there? There's so many houses, there's so many places. How can one rocket misfire and cause that kind of damage? It's illogical. And yet, on the other side, there's rockets deliberately targeting hospitals, ambulances, mosques, schools, you know, UN camps, mm. directly, at shops. They didn't misfire at that time. But only fired, misfired now. It doesn't make sense. What is, what is your people, how many people do you have in Gaza helping? Well, we, because it's not a big office. You know, it's, it's a development office. We do odds and ends. So we've got three full-time staff. But when crisis come, you know, we increase the amount of people. But now I needed to increase the people more because the reality is that my teams can die. I yes. had a horrible job of telling them a few days ago that the reality is that you're going to die. And you need to bring more people in, increase your networks, they said, we know we can die, you know, and we've already done that. And I tell them, take your families, because whilst they're serving other people, and it's very difficult, because the roads are bombed, bombs are falling all over, 
their first words, they've never told me this before. I mean, they're working with me since 2014. It's the first time they said, it's a massacre, it's a genocide. We can't move in the streets, the streets are bombed, we can't get to places, we can't get to the people, and we're scared for our own families when we move around. So I said, asked, I told them something dumb. I said, move your family to a safe place. And they asked me, what is that? There's no such thing as safe place in Gaza. And, and also, I mean, we're hearing that the water is running out, and with water, a lack of water, comes disease. How long are hospitals going to be able to continue to function in Gaza? I, I, to be honest, I can't believe they're still functioning. I don't know how they're doing it for so long. There's, there's three critical components here. One is hospital infection. It's, it's going to spread. Today, the doctors from the hospital said they're now doing operations without anesthetic. They don't have any more anesthetic. And they said by this afternoon or tomorrow, more than hundreds of the patients on the floor are going to die because they just don't have any more supplies. The, the lights are not working, electricity is not working, they're out of fuel, they can't manage. So because of the absence of functional machinery, those people are just going to die, which they could be saved. That's the first problem of, of infection in the hospital. The second one is because the bombing was so intense, but fortunately they managed to do some mass funerals. But prior to that, they couldn't do mass funerals, and you can't do one by one, it's impossible. So the danger was that the decomposition body, bodies is going to cause spread of infection. So they took ice cream trucks and, and fridges to put bodies inside it. But again, that needs fuel or, or electricity, which is not available. And the third problem is because of no electricity and no fuel, the sewage plants are not working, which means you're going to have infection from decomposing bodies and sewage, which is going to co co complicate the situation in for, for disease. Mm. But I think the worst possible thing for me as a doctor is to watch hundreds of patients on the floor all over and take no more, you can't at the Rafah border in the south, but that border's been bombed by Israel, so difficult to get it through. But if indeed there is this agreement, which would have to, I would imagine, be a temporary sort of ceasefire, do you think that could make all the difference for the people in Gaza? It won't make all the difference, but it will make a significant difference, depending on how much stuff gets in. I was with the Egyptian ambassador two days ago, and he said, look, al Arish airport, which is one hour from Rafah, is packed with supplies, and we've got the pictures. There's hundreds of trucks on the way. But we, two, two days ago, there was some kind of story that somebody said there's a five-hour ceasefire. So when we checked with the people, they said no. The trucks came and they were shot at, so they turned around and they went back. And remember what, when you bring a truck from, from because now Egypt is a foreign country to Palestine, so insurance is a high risk. Companies will not send their trucks into a war zone. Insurance, insurance becomes a very high issue. And when, when we went in 2009 and 2014, you come to the border, you offload the entire truck. Then you carry all the goods through the border and you reload another truck. Now imagine how long that's going to take yeah. for all those hundreds of trucks. So yes, any truck that goes in will make a difference because you need food, you need fuel, you need water, you need uh, the medicines, you need medical supplies, you need blankets, you need mattresses. In terms of blankets and mattresses, we've been buying stuff inside. Mm. We can't buy blankets and mattresses anymore, it's finished. Mm. Medical stuff, it's, you know, it's surface stuff. You can't get a real medication and equipment. It's, it's a challenge. Yeah. I, I want to ask you a more a, a broader question because there are real concerns that this could spread to uh, other countries in the region. What we're seeing is after the Hamas attack in Israel, um, you know, it devastated Israel, um, and even moderate people are getting hardline because it's fear based. Um, and what we're seeing happening in Gaza now, even moderate minded people on the other side are getting polarized. But we have seen two other world conflicts that looked completely intractable. One was ours apartheid and the other was Northern Ireland. Both have been resolved in the years. Do you believe there's still a way through in this situation, a way to hear the moderate voices, the people on both sides who want to make a peaceful resolution? Or do you fear that we're heading for all out conflict in that region? No, we're not. There, there's, there's lots of good people on both sides. You know, is, 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 is the Jewish people, there's lots of wonderful Jewish people. I've met them. You know. And there's people on uh, Palestinian people who work with the Jewish people. There's, there's no issue. The, the politics and the support of foreign countries is aggravating the situation. We're sort of endorsing it's fine. Americans are saying we're going to. They don't say, let's calm down, let's go to the table, let's talk. No, we will supply you weapons. We'll send our ship. We'll send 2,000 soldiers. What are you saying? You're actually supporting and the increasing the conflict instead of saying. Let's think about it calmly. Let's see what we can do and let's bring peace. That's what sensible people do. And it's not past the line because both sides know. But any side in any war, there are no winners in a war. 
everybody loses out. And the people who suffer the most are the civilians on both sides. I mean, you can't kill civilians on any side. It's not acceptable. You know, that's, that's a religious law. It's a humanitarian law. So civilians should not be attacked. It's only combatants. But even combatants, if they take the uniforms off, they're just ordinary people. They're their son or the father or the brother of some person. Why lose life? You know, it's easier to have friends than to fight each other. Now, we need sensible people, I mean, sensible governments to say, you know what, stop fighting, stop the weapons, let's get to the table, but it must be a just solution. It has to be a just solution, not some unfinished business, because it will just start all over again. Yeah, we need a proper final plan, and as you say, this is the time for cool heads, and sadly, we're seeing a lot of polarization. Thank you so much, uh, always, for the efforts, um, but also the work in Gaza, and let us hope, indeed, that some sort of humanitarian passage is is created um, because what you've described to us this evening is it sounds positively medieval people operating without anesthetic and just it's just very very sad but thank you for, for speaking you. to us this evening that of course is the founder of the gift of the givers dr imtiaz suleiman well it's